academic and this theater and the place where they both meet. Yeah, Brian and Carson and Tori Devin. Examples of women sharing what it is that you do, sharing how you do that. There's no way you could ignore that news anymore. Work with all women. You can come and see and talk about it. It starts out a little thing, you're right there, you have to be completely open. Theater for everybody, yes, everybody. That's just what should be done. And indeed, my understanding of life, relationships, death, has already changed. The survival of theater as an art form depends on death. So, um, welcome everybody here to the Martini City Theater Center at the uh, Graduate Center CUNY, and I'm thrilled you all uh, came out tonight. It's much the first really beautiful spring day we had today, and uh, we have three days of readings ahead of us, and I think a lot of people say we'll go to the readings, and, um, and, uh, but it's uh, really wonderful for you to come out here. It's a very special moment for us. Um, as you know, for over 10 years, we have been part of the Penvold Voices Festival, it's the most significant literary festival in the United States. It was created by Paul Auster and Salman Rushdie under the time of uh, George W. Bush and his first, uh, the second, uh, and his um, 
some people say regime, others say government, uh, so um, which now looks in a different color than we all thought when they came uh, went to the White House. But they felt at the time already that there was a tunnel vision in America. Penn made statistics, 95 to 96 percent of all books published um, are actually from American writers or uh, British writers, the five, four, five percent, half of them are German, half of them are French because their government subsidies help them to publish. And so from the rest of the world, of the 180 countries, you here have one or even two books, the most. So, and they felt that what's uh, great about America, uh, uh, we know, but maybe that uh, what is not so great, people don't even know enough about a vision of uh, the whole world, and, um, and that this is a contribution to an openness, and we have been privileged to be part of it for um, so many years. And we always had writers from different regions of the world, um, uh, from um, Africa, Australia, from the Europe, uh, from Eastern Europe, or from uh, South America, and whatever. For this year, for the very first time, we thought uh, to highlight uh, one of the great theaters in the world, I think it's the Gorky Theater in Berlin. Um, there were uh, two of the artistic directors were uh, invited to come, but uh, as you know, it's a very busy time at the moment. It's the Berlin Theater Treffen. There is also preparations for the summer festivals. And um, Shermin Langhoff, one of them, uh, looked like till two days ago she could come, and um, she didn't. But uh, we have a fantastic team here with us uh, tonight, and we're going to learn about a theater that is really very different from uh, most of the theaters, uh, especially we know here in the U.S., but also from the Berlin or the German theater or the European theaters. So I won't take a talk about too much. We're going to see the next three days six plays and. Um, Christopher here, who is with us, and Antje Oegel, who I would like to thank for helping us also to do this uh, festival and putting it together. We selected those plays, who are one of the most meaningful um, from those over 10 years, 12 years of the run of the Gorky. Um, um, and so it's a very uh, significant, uh, I think, selection and uh, voices from uh, all around the world, also from the Gorky, even so it is a theater in Berlin. And we will learn more about it. Um, the Siegel Center ourselves, we do bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater, as you saw in our little propaganda video. And uh, thank you for uh, sitting through it. And um, so this is really at the heart of uh, what we do to also expose minority voices from countries that are not known. So normally we don't have so many from Germany or France or the UK because we feel they are already well, very well presented. But this is a very special case with the uh, uh, Gorky and I. Welcome um, two of the uh, uh, playwrights. This is Nora, who is here, Sivan, one of the great actors of the Gorky Ensemble, also a writer, and the buyers are in here is stunning what they all uh, already achieved in their uh, life and work. And um, so thank you all for coming, Dimitri also, and um, Christopher for helping us to put this together. It's now it takes a lot of coordination and uh, thanks to Lida and Michael up there to uh, make this happen. So. It's the very beginning, that's why I'm talking a little bit more than usual, uh, uh, and um, tonight really we're going to focus on the uh, Gorky Theater. So if you have a cell phone now, it's starting, take it out and just have a look, that's off, I'll do the same. So tonight we won't have the readings, all the readings will come in the upcoming days, and. Um, but uh, uh, we are going to learn a little bit more about um, the theater. And we thought um, to ask uh, Christopher, um, who is with us here, um, who works since many years with, this, with the Gorky, to tell us a little bit, what is this theater all about? What's the Gorky? Okay. Good evening. Um, yeah, what's the Gorky? Um, the, I would describe the Gorky Theater since it's run in 2013 uh, with the uh, artistic direction of uh, Shamin Langhoff and Jens Hilje as a hub in Berlin um, of um, theater art for um, many different voices, many different people, min uh, minorities, but also I wouldn't say it's only minorities. It's uh, when uh, the artistic direction started, both artistic directors said, we want to do a theater that represents the city of Berlin. And the city of Berlin is a very diverse, very open, very uh, multilingual 
uh, um, population of people. And this very diverse uh, population of the city of Berlin, we want to show on the stage. And uh, to put the focus on uh, themes of migration, of exile, of feminism, of queer uh, identities. Um, so I would say that is the idea of the Gorky in some sentences. So tell a little bit about the idea of the ensembles and the artists. How are they selected? Or how, how are they composed? Um, well, it, what was very unique at the time in 2013 was that when the new artistic leadership started, um, what was very, very significant is the very, uh, very diverse ensemble. So that we have an ensemble that is put together of um, people coming from very different backgrounds uh, and um, identities. And um, that was very unique at that time. Uh, if, you, if you looked at the theater scene in Germany at that time, you usually had uh, only white uh, actors and actresses on stage. And also what also was very significant is that you, you'd see in the acting schools, you'd see m uh, white, actors and actresses and uh, mostly who would identify as heterosexual in public. So that was uh, not the case with the ensemble. It was, it's very, it was and it is still very diverse, uh, different backgrounds, different, I don't want to say cla class, maybe be because we define it as a, our emphasis is very much about the idea of intersectionality, uh, as Kimberly C Crenshaw puts it is to show the intersections of race, class, and gender. And I think that the, this ensemble, when we started, was very unique in that sense. And everyone in Germany actually took notice because it was so, it was so many very interesting and very fresh faces who uh, made up this ensemble. And uh, what you can see now is a shift, actually, uh, in the German theater in a lot of cities in, in Berlin, but also in very uh, in, in other cities, and also in Switzerland and in Austria, you can see that there's a shift that's starting to happen. Um, just to give a little context, if I don't misrepresent it, uh, Berlin has about, I don't know, 200 theaters and groups all together. There are about 20 to 21 really big theaters, including opera and everything. There are five city theaters, and Gorky is one of them. It's actually under the Linden, it's on a prominent uh, uh, spot. And um, so the idea that it was given to uh, Sherman Langhoff and to create such an ensemble had a very significant uh, role in kind of redefining, redeveloping the idea what a theater um, should be. So what do you think, what's the vision, what's the idea of the Gorky within the city of Berlin? What, is the, uh, what does it want to do? Um, I, I have to do two things. I, the first thing is to say that it uh, that it's also the thing is it's uh, the idea of having a woman as an artistic director in in the German theater is uh, not yet so common. Uh, there was a study made um, a few months ago um, about uh, how how is the structure of the German theater when it comes to artistic direction uh, to authors and to directors. And uh, if you look at this study, it was, it was um, mainly focusing on the idea of uh, men and women in the arts in Germany, in, in the theater. And you can see that 70% uh, of the artistic directors are men, 70% or 74% of the directors for theater are men, and 80% of the writers are men. So there's a big emphasis on the man. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and so it's still kind of a big deal if a woman, unfortunately, it's a still a big thing that a woman is an artistic director. And that was also, there was also this big emphasis on this. Uh, we have now um, Barbara Mundel, for instance, who's going to take over the leadership at the Münchner Kammerspiele next season. Um, and there was also big notice in the press. So it's still, it's still not common for a woman to be leading a theater. Um, so this is one thing I think is significant too. And then the co-director Jens Hillier. And, and that's where I would like to just go one step back because I think it's important to know about 
how the, uh, the Gorky is put together as artistic leadership uh, is that uh, Shamin Langhoff already before she took over the leadership of the Gorki was the artistic uh, director of the Ballhaus Nauninstraße. Ballhaus Nauninstraße is a small off theater in the Berlin district of Kreuzberg and Kreuzberg um, is very, very diverse, but it also has a huge uh, minority of the German Turkish population. And uh, she basically, uh, in 2008, when she started uh, in, at Ballhaus, she uh, coined the term in Germany in, in theater of post-migrantisches Theater or post-migrant theater. So the idea of creating a theater and art and a space for people coming as, who came as migrants and, their, and also the children that uh, live, live in Germany and uh, or people also who came into exile into Germany or identify with many diff a, a very diverse uh, um, background and to th to think about the idea of what comes after the idea of of this background you know being a German Turkish um, person in Berlin and doing art and opening this safe space for for a lot of different people who until that time were n basically not represented in Germany in the theater. So I think that's one important issue to understand the direction of the Gorky. And the other thing is uh, the co-director Jens Hillier who before he started uh, at Gorky with Chamin Langhoff was part of the artistic uh, leadership of the Schaubühne and together uh, with uh, Sascha Waltz, a uh, famous dancer, uh, choreographer, and now artistic co-director of the um, Staatsballett, uh, uh, the ba ballet in Berlin, and uh, Thomas Ostermeier. Um, and the three of them actually built in 1999 this very uh, successful and super interesting um, theater idea of creating new plays creating a very diverse uh, theater um, uh, and which was very open to the idea of new playwriting and to this idea of um, basically creating a, a leadership that was uh, that included the process of the actors and the and and the theater of creating a, 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 a direction together so that's the two yeah, so say. maybe we look, you brought some stuff, yes. um, so tell us a little bit um, what we're going to see. Okay, so this is the, the front, the main entrance of the Gorky, uh, and it's uh, basically, you can see it's, it's uh, um, very Greek, because uh, if you know the Acropolis in, in, uh, in uh, Athens, uh, it's the entrance, it's also the same, it's built after this entrance, and it, uh, yeah, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, and just to get a sense of where it is located, I mean, it's in, in Berlin Mitte, it's right in the middle of Berlin, and this is the uh, Staatsoper, the, the opera, the state opera. It's also a very beautiful building that you can see when you, when you stand at the Gorky, you, you look onto the state opera. Um, you can go to the next one, please. Uh, the Humboldt Universität, one of the two big main uh, universities in Berlin. Um, we can go to the next one. <laughs> and this is the Bode Museum. This is the museum island, we call it, Museumsinsel in Berlin. A lot of different uh, museums that surround the area of the theater and in the middle of the city. Uh, okay, we can go to the next one, please. Uh, yeah, this is the front again. It says uh, der Bevölkerung, so for the public, basically, if we translate it. Okay, we can go to the next one. And this is the inside of the theater. This is the main stage, which is right now closed. Uh, we, we had our last show on, uh, on 1st of May, and it's being renovated right now, and we're gonna be back uh, playing on this beautiful stage in September. And we're building, actually, a container, a black box in front of the theater uh, that, uh, where you can seat 200 people, and in this room you can seat four, um, a bit more than 400 people. Um, and if I remember the word for Denkmalschutz, I would say it. Frank, do you know it? Um, or Antje, what's Denkmalschutz? 
it's a, a historical building landmark. Yeah, it's it's protected, so you you can see the 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 portal, and the you can you can't change anything. So you have these the grids on the in the front of of the portals because you can't drill any holes in it because it's it's all protected. So that's sometimes a bit of a not problem, but it can get tricky if you want to do very uh, different lighting. Um, yeah, and so this uh, beautiful space is being renovated. Um, we can go to the next one. And this is um, the view from the other side. So, <laughs> so um, and the funny and the interesting thing about the, the stage is it, 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 it's, uh, it tilts in a, a degree. So it's not, it's not flat. It has, it's, uh, has a right. So you can't actually, if you put something in the back of the, of the stage, it will roll down. <laughs> That's unusual. Uh, but, um, okay, I think we can go to the next one. Okay, um, this. Uh, so uh, now we could. I think we can just uh, talk about some of the um, uh, the key uh, productions from the beginning of the of the Gorky from 2013. This is. Es sagt mir nichts das draußen. Uh, the so-called outside. There is a reading on Thursday, for, and the play is from Sibylle Berg, and it was uh, called a th um, p piece of the year by the uh, Theater Heute Theater uh, Today magazine, which is the m most important uh, theater magazine in Germany. And it was uh, was uh, uh, Sibylle Berg was the uh, got uh, play of the year for this show. Uh, Sebastian Nübling directed it, and it was a uh, very interesting, very um, uh, unique piece of, uh, the, it's a chor chorus piece, I would call it, of the four performers uh, speak in, in as a ch chorus of women, uh, and also it's choreo choreographed in a very funny and very interesting way, and it deals with feminism and the idea of a feminist of our time. Uh, okay, we can go to the next one. Um, this was a production where I was also involved and it's, it's one of my very favorite productions um, and I uh, really loved working on it uh, by Falk Richter, Small Town Boy, which will be read on the 8th, yes, on Wednesday. Um, the idea of, um, Falk, it was Falk's first work for the Gorky Theater and it had a huge impact in Berlin. It also got the Stonewall Award. We had many, many shows and it toured and it, it's basically, Falk um, wrote this piece about the idea of, um, you know, putting the gay man Basically, or it's a suburb kid, you know, I, um, w the the song "Small Town Boy" from Bronski Beat, you know, the idea of leaving the suburb, going into the city as a young gay man, and how does that? How do you work on? How does that change your identity? And how do you deal with being gay in the suburbs, and then going to the big city and uh, having this kind of new freedom? of living and expressing yourself. And, but it also deals with the idea of patriarchy and violence. And at the time when the play was produced, we had this, uh, um, the situation in Russia with the, where basically the, the Putin uh, said, or the, 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 there was this new law that basically put pedophilia on the same uh, level as homosexuality, and this was a huge issue. And it was, and you can see the see Putin in many different uh, poses <laughs> on the stage. Look at, at some of the clips, maybe of. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Which uh, anything, any specific one, or should we show one from? Maybe maybe we start with Papa Liptich, Daddy Loves You, which will Did be no read. Yeah be read tomorrow. Die dunkle Nacht der tiefen Mitte einer Geschichte. Der Beginn der Fahrt liegt weit zurück, unerreichbar und das Ende ist nicht in Sicht. Sicher, aber verborgen. Man kann volle Fahrt kein Rasen, ohne es überhaupt kommen zu sehen. Eine Fliege, die auf eine Glasscheibe knallt. Hips and shoulders, hüften, 
und Schultern. Ignorieren nur eure Blicke. Aber ich, ich sehe euch trotzdem. Should we? Uh, I think we should then show dark uh, or make uh, first make the making off by Nora Abdel Maksud. Ein Spiel aus Potenz, Dominanz und Kontrolle und doch das heiligste Wunder der Natur. Wir fangen mit dem Showdown an. Der Schakal, das Mädchen und du, ihr seid auf einem Flügelträger, einer Boeing 737. Wie lange noch? Bis sie explodiert! 35 Sekunden! Oh, ja. Hörst du das? Da kommt! Hol den Präsidenten ans Telefon! Die Schauspielerin ist nicht verfügbar! Ja, körperlich, körperlich nicht verfügbar. Wir brauchen jemanden, der verfügbar ist. Ja, natürlich, natürlich nackt! Trägst du nie ein BH? Nee. Okay, and then walk on the dark side by Yael Ronen and Ensemble. Yael Ronen, who was with us, I think, two years ago at the Penn Festival, was Common Ground. Wir haben es grundsätzlich mit zwei dunklen kosmischen Entitäten zu tun. Ja, nennen wir sie doch einfach mal The Dark Brothers. Und diese beiden Dark Brothers, ja, die kämpfen eine kosmische Schlacht von epischen Proportionen. Oh Gott, ich bekomme einen Nobelpreis dafür. Du Pfeife, du nicht. Ich bin interessant. Die haben mich alle untersucht. Ich bin ein interessanter Fall. Also ich finde es sehr schön, dass ihr alle den Weg hierher gefunden habt, um mit mir meine bedeutende, man kann sagen, revolutionäre Errungenschaft zu feiern, die tatsächlich mit großem Abstand das Beste ist, was mir in meinem Leben passiert ist. Ihr seid meine Brüder und ich, ich vergebe euch. Aua. Viel von ihr gehört, Magda. Ich glaube, wir haben uns nur kurz bei der Beerdigung gesehen. Ich war nicht auf der Beerdigung, ich war in der Klapse. Schön. <lacht> auf die Liebe! Prost! So that gave us a little, a little uh, uh, view how it looks like. Of course, they are all full-length plays, and so much more is going on. Before we come to you, how successful is the Gorky? Do people say we're not going to come and see any of this, or how is that? What are the audiences? So how successful or how, how are the yeah, audiences? Yeah, you are it's <laughs> sensationally successful, I think. But yeah, um, th there's tickets and audiences and aud in the. Well, I think it's been an amazing run for the last years, and um, there's people are noticing the work, and it's it's spreading all around, and uh, it's it's really you can see it what kind of an impact it has in Berlin as 
you know, when you say gawky, you, most people already have a, an idea of what the gawky is, and also all around Germany and in Europe. Um, and I think the audiences, it, uh, it's, it's really interesting to see that, uh, especially in the, on the main stage, of each night you have a very, uh, many different audiences coming in. Um, people coming for the first time, people coming to look at the play for the sixth time, uh, and, uh, new, uh, and a lot of different people. So it's not like we have one audience, or I would say that this is the audience, but what I really like about it is that it's always a very different uh, mixed audience. And the interesting thing which uh, we have is that at the studio, at the smaller space we have, um, also in the theater, um, in the studio, we have a, a program that has also plays that are in different languages. So sometimes you have plays that are in German or in Turkish or in Arabic or in uh, Polish, etc. And uh, also concerts and other events or book readings. And what is really interesting to see at the studio is that you sometimes have people coming in for the first time ever into a theater and also seeing a lot of different communities coming in. So if, uh, we did uh, an Arabic piece by Bashar Murkos, who was also part of the uh, Pan World Voices Festival. Um, and then you have a Arabic community in Berlin coming in and watching the play. And I think this is amazing because you reach people you n normally wouldn't reach. And it's a very, very young audience. They're really incredibly successful and fantastic energy when you go to the theater. I also was once for an opening when there's a DJ in the bar afterwards, you know, the actors dance with audiences in a Dionysian uh, interpretation in a way also that the theater is a part of a city that celebrates work and we also, people reflect on each other and the society they live in and uh, on politics. But let's come up to you guys and um, Sivan, um, what does the Gorky mean to you? How did you get to it? Um, I think I can speak to be, be, everybody hears me. No, yeah. it's recorded, oh. that's why. Um, is it on the this one? Yeah. Um, I think that for me, Gorky, first of all, was that I live in Berlin since, uh, yeah, soon seven years. And uh, Gorky was the first theater that basically, yeah, staged my first three plays. How did you connect to the Gorky? Um, well, to say the truth, I wrote a play. I was sitting in South Tyrol in a little conference, reading the play in, in a little theater. And the um, ex-artistic director of Studio Ya, which is the small space of Gorky, just came to me afterwards and said, do you have something additional? Like, could we, could we go like maybe somewhere? Maybe you want to read to me? And a year after, she directed the piece herself. And this is how I entered, like I got to know uh, the Gorky team. And um, then I got um, the opportunity to be staged and my f first three plays were commissioned by the Gorky. Um, so basically, um, I started to write with Gorky. I'm originally from Tel Aviv. I used to direct my pieces, so mainly I worked for the stage. Um, I wrote as well, but it was one factor from, from this thing that I created. Like I used to, no one could read my pieces. And uh, with moving to Germany and starting to work with Gorky, I started to exclusively write. Um, for me, Gorky, I think, um, is a unique uh, theater, a unique space um, to present my works because I think that as a person, as a, let's say, um, a Jewish Israeli woman who often um, is a kind of a diversity joker, let's say, like um, um, it fits, er and, and I think that exactly as uh, Christopher said, um, uh, Gorky created a change in the theater landscape in Germany and now we need, like, the, um, like every theater that respects itself, like would put like this one of those little diversity jokers in each and every uh, season. And I think that often the feeling is that um, 
one is invited or I am invited to, 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 to write a play or to, to write an article or to participate in a panel discussion, uh, but still the discussion is always about me or above my head. I am contributing and giving my experience in order to establish a discussion that is happening um, um, or that is, that is being conducted by the majority and uh, by the group in majority. And um, I think that in Gorky, um, there is a, a, a chance to really mold, in a way, um, um, a theater discussion theater, the, um, in political level and in artistic level that is uh, mirroring this diverse city that is called Berlin. I'm not standing on stage as uh, a representer of anything, but I am somehow uh, from this position in the margins, um, I am saying this is maybe the best view in order to describe the whole landscape, the whole, the whole panoramic picture of society from this position in the margins. Thank you, and we'll come back to this. And Dimitri, also for you, where do you come from, and uh, how do you get to the Gorky, and what does what, what does that theater mean to you? Uh, so uh, originally, I was born and raised in the Soviet Union, and moved to Germany when I was eight, and uh, started studying acting. And by that time, basically, what was uh, told to me that, um, well, or yeah, the the. Uh, for example, in, in Germany it was in the 90s uh, usual for uh, people who are white to change their names so they could still fit in German society and not to see that, that you're, for, uh, to, to, you know, not to show yourself as uh, coming from someplace else. And um, so I started uh, acting school then and uh, worked in a different theater and then uh, when Shamil Langhoff got the, the artistic direction, um, they called me whether I want to be part of that. And the thing is that... As an actor? As an actor. They as an saw actor. your work in Munich? They, they, they saw my work before and, and thought that I could, I could maybe fit in well. And so they, they invited me. The thing is that um, all of us who, who came to work uh, at Gorky um, could have been paid much more money at different theaters mm -hmm. in Berlin, much, uh, in, in all over Germany and Switzerland and Austria. So the decision was really to go there and to do uh, a new form of, of productions and what we talk about. So if you see the, the Gorky sign, the, the R is you know, pu pushed around. It's the Russian uh, letter for Ja, for, for me. Um, so this was kind of the idea of uh, the reflection of me as a reflection of society. So it was not mainly about uh, to, to uh, you know, to get black, white, and, and Jewish, and uh, you know, Arabic people all together, and just to talk about their backgrounds, but to say how can we uh, view uh, onto German society with our backgrounds, and what kind of perspective do we have on German society, which uh, people who have been raised and lived in Germany don't have as much. So, and this, this was this idea, and what became out of it is that we are the only theater in, in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, which is a state theater and makes most of its money with, uh, with plays we write, so with, with plays who, which come out with us. So normally in the German repertoire system, it's, it's usual that you have, you know, the classic piece by Goethe and Schiller and some Shakespeare, but also only the four or five main place which everybody knows you know and so you get audience lure audience in by oh yeah let's see Richard the third for the 100th time and this was now the the idea to write to write new plays to have new perspectives which haven't been around there for for yeah most of the part of humanity so perspectives um, that 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 we started writing on and developing on um, through ourselves and the thing which, which was then astonishing is that to, to, to make you know, a niche product, like uh, an evening like Common Ground, where it's uh, people from, from ex-Yugoslavia 
who reflect upon the war in Yugoslavia and how they perceived it as refugees in different countries, that this is a production which, run, uh, which, which uh, runs sold out every time it's, it's, it's there and, and, and played well over 100 times, sold out every time. And this is something which is really huge and astonishing because we didn't really honestly, when we started it, we didn't think that anybody would give a shit about us. And then something really different happened, or having a um, monologue, which uh, I, I had I've written a monologue for one play about my family coming to Germany and, and this, this migration of, of Russians to Germany, and, and there were about three and a half million of us. And there was never a book about that, or a play about that, or anything. And to play it and have people in the audience be thankful for their side of the story being kind of represented or heard even once. And this was something completely astonishing, having kids uh, who grow up in Berlin and have either Arabic or, or Turkish background and to see Arabic or Turkish actors but not to perform as drug dealers or, or as uh, drug abusers or addicts, you know, but, but having them in a, in a different form of light and which was completely unheard of then in to, to, to have a Chekhov play and to, to have the, the brother of Ranievskaya being, being an Afro-German. And this was something which was completely unique and nobody did it, but once you start doing it and it starts getting, you know, um, it starts getting normal. And this is, this is something which, which was really then huge and became, be, became a huge thing and then started to get people, uh, uh, starting an exile ensemble of people who come from Syria or Afghanistan and be, uh, them having be a part of the, of the ensemble and to hear stories and perspectives from them and to have um, different forms of production. For example, what we do with Yael Ronen, like you saw the, the trailer of Dark Side, is usually to start out with just a topic and then it's just the, the actors and the artistic team in a room and, and just basically talking about their lives for, for a longer period of time. So even, uh, and, and not having a play in mind or what we will do with that, but just to get to know people from completely different backgrounds for several weeks and to hear somebody tell his story of how he, how he fled and, uh, and went through throughout the, the Middle Sea and to, to, come, to come to Germany, this whole, um, yeah, this whole route and explain it, but not in, in 20 minutes time, but in two or three days that you listen to somebody. And this was then a complete shift of perspectives of people who, who, who worked, so we... You went to the Balkans, right? You took a trip? Uh, so some people, yeah, some, sometimes it's with, with plays that... that went that, back that, to that, the that, that stories that, they you, told. that you That you do trips in order to, to prepare it, and the trips then become the main part of the show. And sometimes it's just really listening to people and sharing uh, their own stories and thus growing together as an ensemble and developing your, your point of view as an actor, which is really something, so now it's, it's really hard for me to imagine working in another theater because really just this thing of all right, so we here we have like Richard III and somebody will be playing him and mm -hmm. Shakespeare meant this and that by that. It's kind of boring, or it, it, it gets boring if the normal process is you sit in a room with various people, with insane people, with, with people with insane life stories, and just to get to know that. And then the artistic part is, yeah, we'll do that in the last one and a half weeks. And it's, it's good. It's good because you, you build it all up from, from, from within the group. And that people got interested in that, this is really the biggest miracle because, yeah, as I told, we, we all thought that the Berlin audience will hate us, that nobody, nobody will pay attention to that, but the, the, the contrary happened, and this is something astonishing. Yeah, maybe, uh, Chris, uh, a word about the Exil Ensemble. What is that in, it was in the Gorky ecosystem? Uh, yeah, the, the Exil Ensemble was uh, created um, I'd say out of the thought in 2015, um, there was the play by Irun, the situation where uh, I have uh, played one of, uh, was part of the production and Karim was also part of the production. And uh, I have had this idea of, um, because he, he, he's from Syria 
and it, you need to know th there's only one uh, academy in, in Syria for acting, for theater in Damascus, one. And everyone knows each other. Um, so he already had a network of people he um, wanted to bring into the Gorky. Um, and because it was also parallel, 2015 was the peak of, uh, I, I have to say the word, although I don't like to say it, the refugee crisis. One million Syrians yeah. came to came Germany. Came into Germany. Um, and so basically Germany had this new, uh, they called it this new reality of people coming into the country and uh, having to, uh, to adapt to the situation. So it was part of the everyday life now, um, so it seems. But uh, I mean, migrants have been coming in for a very, very long time, but now you had this huge impact that was going on in, in the press and in the streets, and you could see people speaking a different language, Arabic, which was also kind of frightening for a lot of people because it's still connected to an idea of, I don't know, that Arabic is connected to terror or war, uh, or only to these two things. So um, th this idea was with Ayham and uh, with, with Shamin Langhoff and with the, with the Ancilia and the theater was to create a space for an ensemble that uh, could come and work at the theater alongside the ensemble and al uh, alongside the repertoire that we were doing as to allow them to, to continue their artistic process because the, and they also did the Hamlet machine, right? Or they did Hamlet machine. Interestingly with, enough, yeah. instead of yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's a, it's a it's it's a process because, uh, uh, and I want to say that they're not all refugees because when you have this idea of exile ensemble, it immediately always goes to the idea of refuge. But they're they're. Uh, the, the ensemble is made up of people who are, uh, came as refugees, but also people who decided on their own to come and work in Germany as to, to be able to express and work on their craft, which they could not do in Syria anymore. And uh, we have one actress from Afghanistan. And so this, uh, then uh, this idea grew out to create this exile ensemble. And, um, they started doing their own production, Winterreise, um, with the Elron. So they took a trip through Germany. The Heinrich Heine. The Heinrich Heine um, motif. And uh, to, to see different stations in Germany, and as Dimitri also said, um, to, to share their personal stories. And uh, we, we need, uh, need, what I need to say is that at the beginning, I mean, they came in and they were speaking English and Arabic. And so uh, there was this process of learning German and, uh, you know, being as a group together, coming in, doing this trip through Germany and sharing the experiences and then creating this piece. And Hamlet Maschine is kind of a step forward. It was a, I think it was a step forward in a, in a sense of how to deal with the idea of what I would say post-post migrant theater is that it creates something new. I mean, we can look at the trailer for uh, in, in a second, is the idea of um, creating a piece that works on a multilingual level and creating a space where it doesn't matter anymore. And uh, I, I think the, the ensemble itself made a really amazing process because they started, maybe we should watch Let's it and then I'll say something about it. You know what time is it? It's a crazy clown time! Yes! Heine Muda! Enjoy it! Worten ihr mit Spiele? Die Frau am Strick, die Frau 
Frau mit der Überdosis, die Frau mit dem Kopf im Gasherd. Ich gehe auf die Straße, gekleidet in mein Blut. Ich gehe auf die Straße, gekleidet in mein Blut. No, thanks. Wenn sie mit Fleischermessern durch eure Schlafzimmer geht, werdet ihr die Wahrheit wissen. Can I get? Is it interesting? Read it. It's Heine Mule. Wenn ich schaffe, ich kann auch mal ruhig und dann, 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 schaffe, dann, 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 schaffe, dann, schaffe. Maybe a little bit more about it, then we move on. You said yeah. you wanted. No, I just uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, been an very um, interesting process just to have this this ensemble with us and um, to see that it started from this idea of of a closed group, and now it has moved on into that uh, four actors are part of the ensemble. They're uh, they can switch very easily between German, English, and Arabic, and I find that an amazing process. So it's a truly sensational. Just imagine the public theater would say, or the New York Theater Workshop, we have an ensemble, or we have refugees, or we have actors, you know, they can do what they want, give them a space and support their production. I don't think uh, we, we, we will see that here in New York where you might imagine it should be actually a step ahead and it should have happened a long time ago. But let's talk a little bit about the uh, way you produce your work. I mean, uh, Hans Thies Lehmann said here actually, when he came last year, he said, you're one of the things that are not so clear in his post-traumatic theater theory that he never meant it's the end of writing or writing is no longer as important. He said what is important, there are new ways of writing in a way like Hannah Müller and Elfriede Jelinek or René Polish or others work with text, that it's a new way. So um, tell us a little bit more, um, let's say for your play, uh, how does it work? You write it and then uh, what's the next step? You also work as a dramaturg. How, how do you engage with the work? What happens? when you wrote the play or when you or for also you you create the play what is the process um yeah to say the truth i am uh, after um i started with developing texts with actors in a rehearsal room and now these days i somehow after 10 or 12 years of working on stage with actors I'm now alone in my kitchen every day writing and somehow putting everything on the page, so from stage to the page, which is kind of old-fashioned, I have to say. Uh, still, it's the way that I choose to do it. Uh, I think that... Um, Let's say you bring the text to the Gorky. What, what happens? Um, I think just uh, before that, I think that um, um, in a way... For me, in my writing, and I think very much um, uh, Gorky is a very good partner for that, um, I would never define uh, the bodies on stage. And uh, I would ask the director to put uh, her or his hand into this empty glove of text, uh, of textile that I am designing in order to check in a performative way, who speaks, where, to whom, and why. And um, this is for me, uh, I mean, I would wish, I think my, my, my deepest wish is that every play could have um, been given um, three or four stagings in order, um, or let's say for the audience to reflect what kind of choices are we doing when we are putting <laughs> a body on stage? Uh, how do we see a normal body on stage? How do we see, like, which ages do we tend to see on stage? Which uh, skin colors, which backgrounds? And I think that for me, uh, the most important thing is to always ask the director to answer this question. I have other colleagues, for example, Sasha Mariana Zaltzman, uh, that was here last in year. Year, last year. Um, Eagle, yeah. I know that uh, her strategy would actually to write characters that are so clearly representing something that the ensemble misses that they have to bring a different body to stage. So now, for example, I'm willing to write a choir for um, 10 
women that are above 50 or 60? And can we find them and can we see them on stage? So this is another strategy uh, that I think that works very well. Thank you. The same question to you. <laughs> how, how you also uh, became very well known and he's really one of the most recognizable also actors in the Gorky and it's really, we want to thank you for coming and taking your time to come here uh, to be with us. Um, so um, how does that work, the play you do? So how do you create the text? How is it distributed and created? And how do you interact if there is a dramaturg or the kind of artistic leadership? Yeah, so um, first of all, it, it, it kind of developed. So, so this, this form which I talk about was something which was not already made, and, and we, we, but we kind of you know, got into it, this, this form of developing place. So, um, uh, but I need need to go one step back for it to 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 explain it. So, um, in in Germany there uh, was a tradition that after the 1990s, uh, kind of the well-made play, which is uh, you know in in England or also here quite popular, died out almost completely. <laughs> and then it started the time of deconstruction, so of deco de deconstructioning plays. Uh, and mixing them with with other topics, and so thus became you know those uh, ten hour long German theater <laughs> evenings with yelling people and just doing kind of a Dostoevsky novel, but where nobody should understand anything or feel <laughs> anything uh, or just really be repulsed so so this this idea of of creating art through through you know yeah pushing pushing the audience away and to say which which is kind of a bit brechtian but very you know very aggressive towards the audience so this this was kind of the the uh, the most play which which started to be developed in the in the early 2000s so uh, there was not not a big interest in you know in original writing and then there came a few writer directors uh, who developed their own style of, of postmodernism. And um, one thing that was that was said in connection with with the Gorky was um, a word which I really like by by a journalist, and it was the post-ironic theater. So in the in the 1990s and 2000s, there became you know because Germany was quite prosperous and everything went well and you know the wall came down and the com and communism was defeated so everything was kind of you know amazing so um, so people started just writing ironic plays which were in the end about nothing and they had nothing to say but just were were word plays or something you know be, being about boredom and depression and stuff like that and so um, and and the the style of acting was also a style of acting which pushed away the naturalistic acting or the emotional acting the actor who identifies with what he talks about but it was just really about somebody who just stands there and screams text like this basically for two hours so and um, um, so in, in 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 order to 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 do what 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 we started doing, uh, it was necessary to get new plays from people who actually have something to say, <laughs> besides you know telling telling the world that they're depressed and I don't know so so some kind of message about society some kind and it doesn't even really matter whether it's through uh, uh, expressed through characters or whether it's expressed through. Uh, you know, uh, uh, a text which is about 100 pages long, and there is no, there are, are no, you know, um, no dots or something in it. It's just like, a text. but still, if you have something to say, so this was the first necessary thing which we needed to have in in German theater in in the 2010s, and um, so also the style of acting changed due to that at least with our theater, uh, so that if you have texts which are really about something and th which want something and which want to express something, um, there became a new form of emotional playing or of authenticity, some might call it, but I personally don't like the word because you can also be uh, very funny. It doesn't mean that you sit on stage and cry about stuff. It's unnecessary. But the process of, of, uh, of developing new plays um, for us was uh, so either start out with a topic and then throughout conversations and, and ideas which we collect as, a, as an ensemble, 
developing a play and uh, it, it can vary in structures. So either a well-made play <coughs> or a play which is much more performative and also it may var vary in, in tone, whether it's funny or highly emotional. It depends on what you find actually when you, when you go through the process. But um, and the point of, uh, of, of that was still that everything we do, we really try to mean it and we really try to, to, to act it with that it's something which we really connect with. It's, it's, it's world that we design, which we actually connect with. And sometimes this process might be quite difficult for directors or also for writers, because if an actor who is then used to or trained to say, I want to give a shit about what I tell here, it's not just a text, I want to perform and just cry a few tears, but I want to mean it, I want to understand why do I say it, why do I do this? And some t so sometimes um, I take the liberty of cutting out maybe some paragraphs which the author written, but I just say I, I cannot with, with my with my conscience it's not it's not possible to say that because I think it's dull or stupid or whatever. It's just <laughs> <laughs> so, but then, uh, so but 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 no <clears throat> but but <laughs> so sometimes it's very, very difficult. <laughs> Or sometimes, sometimes also that that you need to 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 re restructure it or, or rewrite it or give it uh, or give us. it give it your own spin, but in in general the 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 thing of uh, an author gives gives you a play and you have to do it exactly like the author wants. It's just if it's an author director like Nora here who is a who is very 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 strict. She's the Indiana Jones of of director her own plays, but. Yeah, ba ba basically, it's it's throughout communication. But tell us about you. You're known also for writing monologues. Yeah. inserting. How does that work? How how do you do that? And um, um, well, basically, I, I it's it's it's, it's uh, full freedom of something that if you want to express something and if it resonates, then then I sit down and write for a few weeks. So you say to the director, I want to write a monologue, and I want to put it in there yeah or may, maybe I'll just write it and then I said I've written something and just would you would you watch over it and then I'll just present it and then she says yeah just just do it and then you do it but yeah okay. but basically it come it comes out really out of, of, of this thing of if you have to add something uh, thematically so so f through through the themes that are that are done there and um, yeah, most of the time, not that, yeah, I always wanted to do, you know, a musical number or something, so even just, just if it fits. So the content comes, always comes first. Content so before, before form. And yes. Yeah. And then I normally search for the form for it. Yeah, so to you, I don't know how does it work. Is Charmin or Jens or you, do you go to rehearsal and then you say, we don't like it, we like it. What's your input in the production? I have an idea also, I want to write something, or what, how does it work? Uh, so, but, but do you mean in, in a sense of what does the artistic leadership do in the, yeah. in the, in the do rehearsal? Yeah, the, the, as a dramaturg, are they, all, are they all also dramaturgs, or are you just the dramaturg? How does that, do, uh, is it also an unusual role the artistic leadership takes in? How do they interact when, with the rehearsals or the work? Well, I mean, um, it's important to say that uh, each, uh, each production has its own dramaturg. Um, but the I, but I think selected by the playwright or uh, well uh, it, it, dep it like d depends some some dramaturgs have their directors they work with they they're familiar with them or with the authors so they have a connection and they truly understand the language for me for instance I have a big connection to Falk Richter because I've worked for, for with him for a long time so I know his sense of w I know exactly what he says when he writes something or when he interacts in a, in a rehearsal, so I know what he what he's doing, and I think every dramaturg has this, and um, and the artistic leadership. I, th I think it's a it's a process that we do together. Is we sit together and we really uh, talk about what what kind of what in which direction do we want to go? What are the ideas of the directors? What are the ideas of the authors? And what would the what would the ensemble talk would like to talk about? So I think it's a, it's a process that happens together, uh, as in 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 way of okay, what kind of productions or uh, 
uh, directors do we want to work with this in this season? But And then when it comes to the production itself, we have one dramaturg or sometimes two dramaturgs for one production. And basically what we, we, we do is uh, we come in at the end of the process. So like for, for instance, in the last two or three weeks, we- How long is the rehearsal, six weeks? So, uh, well, the, most of the rehearsals are eight weeks, and so you have, or, or nine weeks, so you have kind of, uh, <laughs> is that short or long for Incredibly long, it's is it unthinkably long. long. <laughs> It used to be. It used to be longer. And you know, 30 years ago, you had four months for a production. Oh, <laughs> we write a play in that time. We need to rehearse it. So, <laughs> so you have basically you have. Well, the process itself starts before. So before even before you go into production, you have this process where the dramaturg meets with the author. They ha have a discussion and then with the director, and then you have this whole build up to the to the pr uh, uh, rehearsals. Phase. And in the rehearsal phase, you have this basically, and I think it's important to have this space for the director, the dramaturg, and the ensemble as a team to create something and not to interfere too much, because I think it's important for you to create something. And then basically, you have this tech uh, rehearsals, um, which start three weeks before, where you start to go on stage. You have the you have the real stage. You have the props, so it starts to take shape. And I think this is a good point to get into the process as the team of the dramaturgs. So we basically come to the runs, the run-throughs, and we just um, we just talk about the, with the process. And I think that's what Shamin and Jens also do. They do. Uh, yes, of course, but it's not about, it's not this idea of you have to do this. It's just the idea of, well, I see this, maybe you could do this. And so it's a process of selecting. And may I add something also, which, which is also very, very different. So in other German theaters, it's normally when the artistic directors come in, they watch the, they, they watch the run through and then they only talk with the director. And then the director tells you, well, you, we need to cut this scene and stuff like that. And this is really the, the, the only process uh, where the artistic uh, team, uh, where the artistic directors also meet with the actors. So most of the time that you're all together hearing what, what there is to say or what are their concerns, which I find a very, very healthy process. So also if you develop something, it's necessary if you develop something with, uh, with the director, um, it's very necessary that not the, this director all of a sudden gets heat from the, from, the, no, from the bosses and then just starts changing something but that you still can talk about it. And even uh, I also had situations where Shamin and Jens were completely opposite in the opinion of what I should do on stage. And then it's, it was just like, yeah, you need to shorten this. No, I won't do it. But you need to. No, I don't. So even, even if you, 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 you can, you, I'll play the opening night like I do it now. So you will need to hunt me down from the stage. But, and then they say, okay, then just try it out. Then so so this this kind of this this form of of, of understanding or respecting each other's uh, each each other you know uh, abilities and on the other hand uh, on the other hand really to say or, or to have an uh, an argument which is which is about the content of the play and to say it's just plainly wrong or there are the, this and that s solutions to do it in a, in a smarter way so which is much more fruitful and not as uh, dictatoric. You know, author or authoritarian, as it's 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 used to in in other German theaters. Can I just add? And I think yeah. And we, uh, to add what you just said, I, I think it's also the role of the dramaturg uh, in 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 a theater like the Gorky is also a bit different because uh, the dramaturg is not there just to you know to edit the text or you know just to be just to do what the, the director wants. But the, I think this kind of dramaturgy is, is, is a dramaturgy that is, a, is involved in the process. Because if you look at other state theaters, um, you have dramaturgs who come in once a week to look at the rehearsal and then to give feedback. And uh, f with us, the dramaturg is always present in the process. It's, it's, it's a vital part of the process and a voice inside the production. And I think that's really important to, to point out because it changes the process. Yeah, very important. Or anything you, before we go to audience questions, something you 
comes to your mind or something you want to add? Concerning the dramaturgy? In, ge no, in general, anything we said about? Um, well, I, I can talk about the kind of dramaturgy I need. <laughs> because I, I write the plays myself and then I direct them myself. Mm -hmm. So the moment that I come to the first rehearsal where we are like talking about the concept, I am already pretty blind <laughs> for the stuff I wrote because I deal with it for month and month and month. So what I need and I found at the Gorky is like a pretty classical dramaturg who tells me like, I have three acts and I need to know what do you understand here <laughs> and what does the audience get there. So this is a kind of classical dramaturgy which actually in Germany right now is pretty hard to find, I think, because it's so old school. And there's more discourse. What heißt discourse? Discourse, yeah. There's a lot of discourse and you have to be very smart and very uh, zeitgeistig. Zeitgeistig. <laughs> Um, yes, as a drummer, so this, these are the skills I think that are very important right now, especially in like the big cities as Berlin. And most of the time I, I need the opposite. I just need craftsmanship. <laughs> Somebody who, which information has to be given where and do people get this character? Yeah, and I found that at the Gorky and I don't find it everywhere. So I'm pretty pleased which is also interesting. We see a variety of styles of writing, directing, uh, of dramaturgy. So it's a very open process. So Michael, maybe we can have the light up uh, for the audience too. And um, we have you know, 15, 20 minutes more. We have uh, always a good audience here um, at the Siegel. So if you have a, a, um, a question or a comment or something that comes to your mind, um, please let us know. Please uh, also take a mic. We are recording it. And maybe say who you are and uh, what you do and then, um, yeah say a, qu a question. Hello, uh, my name is Aaron Max Schloff, and I just have one, um, well, two questions. Um, one, I looked at the Gorky website and I could see that everything is in, in repertory. Uh, how many shows do you have on stage, say on the main stage and on the chamber stage in a month, is one question. And the second question uh, is something that all of these discussions of what occurs in rehearsal is leading to. What is the role of the author, if the author is not the director, what is the role of the author in rehearsal? It seems like the Gorky is dealing almost entirely with living authors, and so it's not like you can ignore, you know, Schiller or you don't need to, Schiller won't return your calls. But, you know, all of your authors, except for maybe Heiner Muller, are, are around and can be consulted if you care to consult them or if they demand to be consulted. I mean, how does it, what does, is the author present? What does the author do in rehearsal? Thank you. Thanks. I'll answer the first question, and maybe someone else can answer the second one. Um, so yeah, we ha we have a repertoire theater uh, system, and well, um, it, it I mean it depends from month to month. But let's say we have around about twenty to twenty four different shows in a month. Sometimes you have blocks like we, where you have. Uh, yes, we have uh, running a repertoire in the, on the main stage, and then we have uh, uh, the, the studio doesn't have this kind of repertoire. We have pieces that are shown in the repertoire, but the studio has different uh, events that happen. We, so have about, we have about 40, uh, 40 plays, 40 different plays which are running. They could be shown at any time, 40 plays. Yes. And yes. So, so we, yeah. So it's a. Uh, so uh, each, each night, I've, I've, I play in nine different different productions. So so it changes, and sometimes you play four or five different plays within a week. Yeah. So you can imagine how many stages are put up and broken down in a week. Or sets. Um, so yeah. So we, we we don't have en suite. We only have uh, uh, shows. For instance, third generation, next generation, which premiered in March, basically sometimes has four or five shows uh, um, after each other. So five days of the same show. But usually we have a different show every night. So you basically have this uh, 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 f these forty plays, which are built up and put down every day. And then you also have the running rehearsals stage it's just second the second, second author um, what's the role of the author is the author engaged uh, in the creative process or 
bystander? It, it depends. It depends on what the author wants sometimes and also what the, what the, what the team wants because some, there, there, are, there are authors who just want to give this away and who don't interfere, who don't even you know, write, write, write characters in there or write any kind of you know, uh, di direction. And some people sit there on, uh, in, within the rehearsal space and try to communicate with you. So sometimes it's, um, it's uh, it, yeah, it, it, it depends on what, what, the author, what, what, what the author wants and, and most of the time also how he or she works with the director. And with the actors. Yeah. Like I think uh, often it happens that actors are a little bit intimidated by, <laughs> by the presence of the author. They're like, okay, what's happening? And I think, like, at least in my case, most of my plays were developed really with the dramaturgs and the directors from, from the first moment. Um, it was <coughs> developed together, then the, sta the idea for the stage design and the process of thinking about the stage, thinking about the bodies on stage was like uh, somehow, let's say, developed together. And then um, um, I, I think that uh, for me at least to, to arrive to the rehearsal room um, and meet the actors and the actresses and um, like I, I found uh, myself in a different role, like when I'm when I when I came to the rehearsal room. So it was a kind of a different level of communication with the actresses and the actors. Like I'm not directing them. I'm not interested like with how they move, what they're doing. But we have a com like they, we communicate in the deep level of the text and of what's really happening. And for example, if there are topics of shame and of exclusion and of fear that are present in the text and are going through these bodies. So sometimes like we discovered that this is an intim intimate discussion happening between the actresses, actors and the writer that sometimes the director said, okay, I'm, I'm out, which was interesting. So it's a variety of styles. There's a question over there. Yeah, for the Penn Festival, is everything in English or are there some uh, plays in the original German? Or Here, will be, everything will be yeah. in English when we do the readings. We translated actually three of the plays for, oh, okay. for, for this festival. Kyoko? Mm. Um, hi, my name is Kyoko Iwaki. I'm a visiting scholar here. Um, first of all, I saw you, Dimitri, I think, in Common Ground when I was in Berlin, and you were the only person. I, uh, I saw a, couple, I mean, a lot of shows when I was there for three months, and most of the soliloquies, as you said, were shouted out top of their voice. I was like, you, your monologue was the only one which didn't like perform in a way that is so obnoxious. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you, your performance was like, like, like a bliss for me. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Yes, so my question to you actually as an actor is that stemming from this experience that I had in Germany, um, so you said that actors, actor methods are still there, the traditional ones. Like, so they, they do, for me, um, seem to act in a certain way, the, the traditional actors. So I hear that you're talking about these different contents, different plays, different directions happening, but then how are the actors trained? Are they kind of um, adopting the new methods, like you know, acting more naturally or more, more, more post-traumatic, of course, but then how is it kind of shifting from these old-style acting? Um, it doesn't, which is a pity. I, 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 um, I, I train actors at acting schools, and the, the level of, of, of acting in Germany is really poor, so most German actors are shitty. And and they're trained in a in a in a in a in a stupid and very old fashioned. Many people manner. would disagree, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the, the 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 problem is that um, that now w what what emerged is this new kind of actor performer. So uh, what were what were in the beginning two different styles of a, of an actor who is a naturalistic playing you know acting acting, and then the performers who you know take some some tube of red color and 
push it somewhere in their body and you know shit on the canvas or something like that. So in the extreme form, so there are still people who do that. Uh, but um, but then it kind of started emerging together. So so the the necessity of being able in the one moment to to have to to play to act a passionate scene. And in the other moment, just you know, uh, turn around to the audience and and talk with them and and have a philosophical text, which you try to present them like a normal human being in a discussion. And this is something which is which is rarely trained in acting schools because the the people um, who 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 perfectioned or or who you know de developed this style. I think this is this is in some something in our which which emerged in our generation maybe of of acting or maybe a few years before. But if they are still active and take part in this, uh, you know, actively, um, they rarely teach. And then in the acting schools, you have um, very 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 old-fashioned people who teach acting. So this is something which usually happens if, if there are people who are interested in that or even, even ask you after you play the show, uh, how do you do that or how do you develop that or what, what kind of technique do you use, um, they, they, can, they can adapt to it. But with most acting schools, it's really, really, really dark. It's dark. But I, if I may add, I think it's also, as, uh, with everything in, in the theater world, it's such a long and weary process yeah. of change what we are now only seeing in the acting schools that they are diversifying in a in a big way is that now it's 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 a trend you see in the schools and also what i would notice not maybe in the acting school but what happens after the acting school right now is this idea and i think it's also you can see it also in the in the gawky from the last year of last seasons um, uh, and would also influence that is that the actors are becoming more active in a sense of their awareness how they deal with theater and rehearsals so they're not puppets they're not dependent on the director it is an alliance of art you know in a sense of everyone contributes and everyone has a br functioning brain to think about what they are doing. So you don't have the almighty director standing there or the almighty author maybe, but it's uh, everyone is on the same playing field and you need to be very conscious about the process that you're doing together. And I think that's a very vital and important thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, d d definitely. So, so the 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 in in terms of of storytelling or how you 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 convey a, a topic, it's it's really something which 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 is new and and people need to adapt to it, so that you're also part of a of a creating team, even if you're just if you don't write anything, but still in, uh, so so I think also most most uh, directors nowadays need need this diverse type of actor. Who is at the same time able, if if you say to him, just you know, play it fast, funny, loud, whatever. So so a, a, a very high level of of craftsmanship, and uh, on the other hand, this ability of being highly highly personal and vulnerable, and direct. So this this is something, and there there are not many people who are able to do that, but hopefully there will be more because this is something which is really which makes the you know what the 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 experience of going to a theater for me at least uh, is something really special because i can since since everybody got netflix and amazon prime you can watch very good actors and actresses perform in in very good movies so if i go to a theater i want to see i want to see individuals i want to see personalities i want to see i want to see real artists and not and not puppets yeah. Maybe um, uh, one more uh, question towards the post post migrant uh, that that term. I mean, in the beginning, often people might have criticized the Gorky, but say, "Show me a problem, and we create a play about it." And um, something switched or happened, and you 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 um, talked about this. I would like to just hear a little bit or two more sentences of this, this idea of a post post migrant theater. I don't know if we even have in New York because there's a post migrant. There's a mi if there's a migrant theater. I'm not sure if there's a post-migrant, but what's the post-post-migrant? Uh, the post-post-migrant 
theater is a theater. <laughs> I think for me, well for me it's it's a uh, it's um, the idea of an the individual being something that is put together of so many different things that you are such a it becomes unique in itself so and and you can look at it from many different angles so if you think about the idea of post migrant um i think we're going in, into a direction of um of the idea of not just what is your background so i would not i'm i mean i, I can only also think about it in my personal sense i'm i'm not I'm not very. I'm not Arabic. I'm not. I would not consider myself German. I was. Uh, I went to American school. I speak three languages. I'm queer, etc., uh, etc. Et so all these things put together create an individual that is me. That is uh, trying to uh, express myself through art. So this this intersection of many different ideas makes makes it very interesting to deal with the idea of, of art so you, you you can you can highlight you can connect to it on many different levels so it's not the idea of well i'm i'm only uh, it's not one fragment so it's post post for me i don't know if i explained well but i think i hopefully got the idea uh, i think that um uh, there are two aspects uh, for me uh, for example, Papa Liptich, uh, Daddy Loves You. Um, so it's a piece that is dealing um, with, um, with um, f the female body and the female aging body. And, and suddenly in one of the parts, there is like a reference to a story of a Jewish um, Holocaust survivor. Uh, of course, that it is already tagged, like in the newspapers in Germany, as a play that is dealing with Jewish, Ger the Jewish, uh, Israeli, German topic. And no, it's not. There is just a voice that is referring suddenly uh, to this aspect. This is for me uh, a new way to, or an important, a way that would be important for me to speak about my background, not as the main topic, not as your topic, but as an element that comes to, 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 to deal with something. Um, I would say that the post post for me is the fact that identity is no more, it's not anymore uh, this one thing that even I decided that it is. It's fluid, it's changing, um, it can't be this like it it, it. it can't be the same like usually. Um, um, every year or every two years, I will have to re um, um, uh, evaluate like what it is and what kind of word I would give to it. I think there was a question. Uh, one second, we get the microphone, and after that, we have one more. And then well, actually, I, actually, to some extent, you already got to my question, but I was going to say that I, I saw the situation in Berlin last time I was there, including your inserted uh, um, monologue, which was, which had I read on the page, I would have thought was distracting, but when I saw you do it, I thought it was brilliant. So, so I think it really worked very nicely. Um, a couple of just things that I'm curious about. So much of the post post migrant experience that you, so much of what Gorky works with. Um, first of all, it's extremely multilingual. So I was just wondering on the technical side, obviously in the situation you did that with uh, super titles and in addition to the fact that you had a fairly multilingual audience, I'm wondering how typical is that and does that limit the kind of audiences that you could otherwise have? Um, I guess the other question was that there's a lot of this um, very Berlin intersectional I'm many things that's actually going to be problematic for a lot of the kind of official community leadership in a lot of these communities. I'm just thinking in the situation there were things that would have made both Israelis, uh, both the official Jewish leadership and the politicized Arab leadership of Berlin very uncomfortable in that play. And I'm wondering how that ends up working out in as these become part of the public discourse. So um, two things, duolingual how does that work? How do you deal with it? Uh, and then um, these messages that are offending each side. 
Well, with with the multilingual, it it's it's uh, of course it 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 it's uh, it has some difficulties uh, within within the developing process, which can be very very difficult. So if you're in a room and trying to talk and you feel really like at the UN or something because here somebody said and translated into mm -hmm. Arabic and here somebody said and, and so so this this is sometimes uh, kind of annoying but uh, but necessary a necessary process so also that uh, sometimes you need to switch to to German in order to express some things which can be purely done if you write a text if 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 I write a text in German and present it to a Ronen who doesn't speak German, but if I have some, some certain nuances which I can only express in German and not in English, or people who write in Arabic but can only explain those, those nuances in Arabic or maybe Hebrew, then um, this, this is a process where you really need to be careful that nothing gets lost in translation, uh, just within the process. And uh, while acting, uh, it's so what also made the, the Gorky um, kind of unique is that we started to subtitle each and every show. Every, so in, every in German, whatever, the normal, where you think, oh, you just do it in German. Everything is translated. Everything has subtitles. Yeah. Like you so, would so say in New York, every play should have subtitles because you cannot assume everybody speaks English. And this is something which we, which we started because there is a huge community in, in Berlin who doesn't speak German, so they have access to it. And uh, then what the, the interesting part then is if you also uh, get Arabic or Hebrew within this, within this equation, uh, it's uh, something interesting happens that while you play, you can see how many people uh, in the audience know this language. Because sometimes then uh, if, if, if people do an, uh, a joke in Arabic and people react to it before it's even subtitled, you know, oh, okay, so we have about 40, 40 Arabic-speaking people in the audience tonight, and so on and so on. But, but for many people, I also, especially for elder people, um, they, they say that it's often quite problematic. If you don't know English, or if you are, if if, if you don't know any of the languages which is uh, which is spoken there, but just to sit there all the time like this and try to watch the stage, is is quite problematic. But this is something which we cannot really, you know, change. Maybe maybe we could do like ear but plugs. And I would some I would I would I would take I would yes. But I think um, I mean if uh, I always like to say if you go to through Berlin, if you walk through the city or if you walk through New York City, you don't just hear English. You hear French, you hear Arabic, you hear Italian, you hear many, a, var a var variety of many different languages. And this is, if we're th talking about representing a, pop a population or a city like New York City or like Berlin, then the idea of transferring it onto stage is for me very natural and you don't have to understand everything to understand. Uh, and speaking as a translator myself, um, I think this is a very uh, potent um, process and thing you can, I, th I think it needs a little bit of training in, uh, for, for an audience, but y there is a, universe, a universal thing of understanding. And sometimes things get lost in translation, but I mean, no, and, and I think that's also natural in the sense, I think we, because we've seen so many plays performed in perfect or seemingly perfect German, that, I, I mean, Schiller, no one talks like Schiller anywhere, ever. <laughs> so is that, the sta is that how we are represented on stage and no one talks like Shakespeare anymore? Um, so I think this is, for me, it's a very natural thing. And it's, um, I, I think it's amazing. Let it be lost sometimes in translation. Then we have the state of the person who walks through a city and sometimes doesn't understand and sometimes understands. And that's amazing. I think it's like great. Some, and sometimes it's also fruitful even for scenes to, to have it, if you, if you know, okay, we could do the scene basically in German, but to have a scene of a couple, but she's Israeli and he is German, but both of them speak in, in, in not too perfect English. Uh, it's an interesting scene, or it becomes immediately much more interesting. It can reflect more al also of this of this situation. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can even use it in the artistic process of yeah making it to to a crucial point within the scene that you don't understand. So like you do, you don't see everything, 
but you also won't understand everything. Just the second question very fast. Uh, right wing, left wing, common ground, were there reactions? Was, did you get uh, bomb threats or did people ab applaud it or what happened? I mean, if you um, do political theater, you're gonna irritate someone sometime anyway, but uh, there were no bomb threats. Um, you know, but I think it's, it's sometimes, of course, it irritates people, but uh, I think for me it's always, if someone asks me, or if, if, I, if I have the situation where I feel like, okay, there's this irritation, I would put it into a, into a discussion of, but why does it irritate you? And it mostly irritates, it's, it's irritating because it questions uh, a status quo that does not exist, in my opinion. There is this idea of, of, of something that is fixed, especially if you talk uh, talk about uh, political conflicts coming from two different sides that are very heated and very uh, very political so, so you got away with it and uh, it works so the last question over here and then um, I think we a bit over time yeah you you mentioned at the beginning that people know what they uh, they know the Gorky so when they go there they they sort of expect something that they that they're familiar with a am I correct in saying that? Uh, well, no, I think there's a certain style or a style, certain okay. idea or so certain authors okay. that are yeah. connected good, to, good. to the good. institution. So and then you mentioned that you have these real, for me as an actor, really long rehearsals, <laughs> uh, which I think maybe is good, maybe not good, I don't know. Um, and then you have 40 shows in rep. Yeah. So when, uh, and I've never been to the Gorky to see a play, and I, I will someday, um, when you put uh, the play on and you do it for a few, five days or f maybe, d am I seeing the play that you rehearsed or am I seeing an, a version of the play you rehearsed? So in other words, because I've seen like Nihai, you're familiar with Nihai? They're from England and uh, they do plays that look totally improvisational and they're actually not. So they're, they're really highly rehearsed so that they look like they're not rehearsed. Is this what you do at the Gorky? Is this is this a? This is kind of uh, yeah. Kind of I, I would I would say this this is sometimes uh, this this I know I, I know this style that that it seems kind of you know very 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 light or on the spot or something, but we, which well, not which necessarily nor, nor, on normally the spot, but it's it's it, it it isn't, but but it's it's rehearsed. But you so see we, the we same rehearse, play. We, we don't. Five days later, you would see more or less the same you saw the you first would see, time. You would see more or less the same thing. Of course, if you have repertoire system, it 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 develops throughout the years, and sometimes there there are shifts. And also, if you do political stuff, it, it shifts uh, due to the perception, or sometimes we even change lines, uh, or, or need to change some things, if it's, you know, biographical and some actors, you know, uh, change, and so we need to write new text within that. But normally, you would see from show one to show 150, more or less the same show. So if you put an actor into the show, like five years later, the dramaturg then, or someone, we, we, we do we, rehearsals we, where we we, we, we do we do new rehearsals. So so for example, if it's a play and it's biographical text, um, the, then the process starts again with the with the new person or per persons. So so that new texts have to be developed and new arrangements have to be done. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but. So um, I know we could go uh, over much longer. We already are um, a bit over time. I think, as we always say, Bright said, we do need new forms of theater for the new times we live in. And I think the Gorky uh, is had found something that's new with the way they work, the way they produce, and the way the aesthetics is new, and this is uh, all connected, and I think it's something to really watch and to, um, and to learn from. So um, it anticipates all that the future, it will be different in the future. It will be languages different uh, in cities and in places. So and it also makes us uh, okay with it. It gives a meaning that it's, you might not understand everything, but it's interesting, it's good, it's full of energy. And again, this Gorky is a fantastic theater if you go there where you really, it's alive. And I think um, uh, hopefully also the readings that are coming up now uh, will, uh, will confirm that, that they are of interest to American audience. They, most of them have never been read, I think none of them. Uh, so these are all completely new, uh, premier uh, place, they've been translated new, so I hope you will come or tell your friends. But again, thank you for coming. Thanks for the Gorky to uh, be here and uh, to be with us. Thank you Thanks for having us. For how, how round to, um, 
HowlRound to live stream it, so it had also a much larger audience. And we all gonna meet uh, at the archive bar now around the corner on 36 between Phipps and Madison, or um, if you want to, hopefully you guys can join us for a drink. Um, if you want to have more. So again, thank you for coming. And uh, so you were here at the opening of the Penwald Voices, the entire festival open today. Go on their website. It's a fantastic program Chip Early put together. And, uh, and I hope we will see you again. We also have some of the directors of the place here, Ashley, Sybil. Um, and um, so maybe uh, we'll go and see their work. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>